All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to session two of our 10 week virtual trauma responsive wraparound training for providers and parents. I'm Brian Post, your host with the most, and um, looking forward to digging in to this next session with next session with you guys. Just a little reminder, friendly little public service reminder that the goal of this training is to provide the participant with a foundation level understanding of human behavior. Human behavior. So I say that because I want you to think about this, this information, not just in the context of your child. That's the first thing we're always wanting to go to is we want to we want to go to the information to our child. And before I even do that, let's just back up right here. This is a 10 week virtual trauma responsive. That's a very important word. Words are very words we use are very important. Trauma responsive. So I've been teaching trauma informed for probably 20 years. And it's just been in the last five years that people have started talking more and more and more about being trauma informed. Well, in my personal opinion, they're too late. Trauma informed is not enough. Trauma informed used to be enough when we didn't really know what trauma was. And so now we have to shift from being trauma informed to trauma responsive. So when I, when I think about when I think about the work that we do, I don't want us to be trauma informed. Just knowing about trauma is not enough. We have to understand how to be trauma responsive. We have to understand how to respond to trauma. And just like in session one, that oftentimes starts with us. So this is to provide the participant with a foundation level understanding of human behavior. So I want you to be thinking about this in the context of human behavior period in relationship to stress, trauma and problem behaviors. This training is specific to adoptive parents and adoption wraparound providers. So we have both groups here. We have our parents and we have our providers. It's the same information because we are the same people working towards the same common goal. And that common goal is to have more love in our homes and in our world and in the lives of our children so we can help them to optimize their brain chemistry and their development and be amazing, unique individuals. So session two is stress regulation and trauma. That is our focus for session two. And as I'm going back and reviewing my 16 week course and all of those slides and, and kind of updating them for this presentation, because that first 16 week training that many of you have done, um, some of you were supposed to do and haven't done, so we're, we're just updating, we're updating that. So this will be our new, you know, kind of flagship training. But as I'm going back and reviewing them, I'm, I'm actually cutting out a lot of stuff because that training wasn't specific to wrap around. So when I present to you over this next, over the next 10 weeks, during this 10 weeks, I want to make this information as specific to wrap around services as possible. So let's start with this question. What is stress? Because you guys know that that is, you know, I developed a stress model. I'm always talking about stress, whether it's regulation or dysregulation, how it, how it impacts us. So what is stress? So I want you to understand this at a, at a really basic level. Stress is an internal reaction to either an external or internal event, which knocks your body out of balance. And it's called homeostasis. So your body is always optimizing itself towards homeostasis. And this is balanced state, which is an optimal state. Well, anytime something occurs outside of you or inside of you, your body has a stress reaction that knocks it out of homeostasis. And then what it has to do is it has to start to work to restore the state of homeostasis. This is very important. Your body, your body mind system, Candace Pert wrote a book. She was a neurophysiologist, wrote a book called Molecules of Emotion. And she said, we should not call it the brain and the body. We should not call it the mind and the body. We should call it the body mind because it's all one working system. And this is, this is really important when it comes to looking at, you know, the way we assess our children's thinking and the way we assess 
their behaviors as some independent experience from their their historical experience. So a lot of times we want to say, or oh, our children are choosing to behave a certain way, or they're acting a certain way, and we want to separate that from their historical experience. And the significance is that you can't. It is the body-mind system. It is all connected. We, we store all memories in our brain. So anytime you are stressed, your body-mind system is always vacillating between a thriving state and a surviving state, a thriving state and a surviving state. We go out into the sunshine, we're, you know, we're enjoying our morning, we're hanging out, we're, we're laughing, you know, we're, we're, we're playing with our kids, we're, we're making love to our significant other, we're doing some work that we enjoy doing, we're in this thriving state. But the moment you become stressed, your body constricts into survival and moves you into that survival state. And so you're always trying to find that balance between the two. So literally any stressful experience, and we're gonna go a little bit deeper than this, any stressful experience will cause your body mind system to move out of homeostasis, out of balance into a state of survival. This is very important. And this is kind of how I came to develop the stress model. The stress model says all behavior arises from a state of stress. All behavior arises from a state of stress. In between the behavior and the stress is the presence of a primary emotion. There are only two primary emotions, love and fear. It is through the expression, the processing, and the understanding of the fear that we can calm the stress and diminish the behavior. So I'm gonna back that up. And I'm not gonna go real in depth in, into the stress model this session, but I wanna give you the framework because the stress model is ultimately the model that I really want you to measure human behavior against. When you can begin measuring human behavior against the stress model, I feel like it, it has the, the potential to revolutionize your paradigm. And you guys know I talked about the paradigm, your paradigm in session one. So this is the biggest challenge. One of the single biggest challenges is that we've been conditioned in our society and in our homes and in our culture to operate in this fear based paradigm. And so what, what we're now challenging ourselves to do is to move out of this fear based paradigm, a paradigm being the way in, in which you see the world, the, the lens through which you view the world, the lens through which you view individuals that's been reinforced and conditioned by generations and, and, and your, your, your family, your culture, our, our dominant society, that conditioned paradigm, we're working to have to change that from a fear-based paradigm to a love-based paradigm. This becomes very important. And, and it is probably the single biggest challenge. The stress model will help you along the way because we know it takes two things to change the brain, emotional impact and repetition. That's why we're spending 10 weeks, 10 hours of repetition, repetition, repetition. A lot of stuff I talk about is repetition. For me, I've been repeating this stuff for 20, three years, one on 24 years. I'd have to do the math as far as how long I've been a social worker. I think it's like close to 25. I'll be 48 in June. Um, all behavior arises from a state of stress. All be right now, right now in your home, for those of you, those of you who are, are adoptive parents, you're in wraparound because you are facing extreme behaviors, extremely challenging behaviors from your child, which is causing a great deal of stress. So you're seeing these behaviors, but what you're not realizing is that these behaviors are arising from a state of stress. These behaviors are occurring from a state of stress. Now, here's what you don't get. Not only do you not get the fact that that these behaviors are rising from stress and that in between the behavior and the stress is the presence of a primary emotion, love and fear. And that it's actually that stress and that fear that's giving way to that behavior. The other thing you don't realize is that when you see behavior, that behavior causes you stress. 
See, this is how we tie back to session one. This is why it's important for you to understand your blueprints that, that you bring to every working relationship. Because the moment you experience your child's negative behavior, the first thing that happens is you become stressed. When you become stressed, it triggers your fear. And when it triggers your fear and your body moves into survival, it drives your behavior. So your child is now stressed and acting out, and now you are stressed and acting out. So guess what we have? We have two people who are stressed and acting out, and it just becomes a conditioned state. I am revealing truth to you. This is truth in its most simple form, or at least in as simple of a form as I've been able to get to it get to it at this point. It is not that the behavior is not overwhelming because it is. It's not that the behavior is not frustrating because it is. It's not that the behavior, you know, doesn't make you feel hopeless and, and helpless in your home because it does all of that stuff. But the significance is that we're viewing the behavior as a threat and not realizing that the behavior causes us to stress which then drives our fear, which then drives our negative behavior. And if you have a child who is stressed out and acting out, so let me, let me, let me go ahead and drop this on you. A stressed out child, and write this down, a stressed out child, and in fact, just write stressed because a stressed out child is an Acting, so right under stress, right, acting, is an acting out child, is a regressed child. Stress, acting, regressed. Stressed, acting, regressed. Stressed, acting, regressed. A stressed out child is an acting out child that is a regressed child. A stressed out child is an acting out child that is a regressed child. When your child is stressed out and acting out, it's because they are regressed. When they're stressed out and acting out, it's because they're regressed. When I say regressed, I say I, that represents emotional regression. When your child is acting out and stressed out or stressed out and acting out and they regress, they're regressing to a, a, an earlier emotional state very important. They're at this earlier emotional state. When you see the acting out and you become stressed, therefore you regress. Now you are acting from an earlier emotional state. This is the essence of a negative neurophysiologic feedback loop. This becomes a conditioned state. It becomes a conditioned pattern. You get stressed, I get stressed, you get stressed, you regress and you're acting, you're acting immature and, and acting out in all these inappropriate ways. And then I get stressed and I regress and then I am behaving towards you in inappropriate ways. Now, the problem is a lot of times we mask this as adults. We mask our own stress and regress state and try to act like we are calm. But see, that's what that's what what's what you can't trick the brain. See, because you're you're Alan Shore said the core of the self is nonverbal and unconscious and lies in patterns of affect regulation. What that means is it's not what you say or do, it's how you feel when you're doing and saying it. So you can look calm, you can look happy, you can put a smile on your face. But if someone is really tuned in, they know that that smile represents a state of stress. And that state of stress represents an experience of fear. And that experience of fear is what's driving that smile. And that happens to parents and kids all the time, right? All the time. And this is, this is going to happen for parents and it happens for, for wraparound providers. You're going to have an interaction with an adult who's stressed out and they're smiling. Now, what are we, how do we label that? How do we classify that in our society? Well, we label that as, as them not caring. As them, as them not being um, concerned, as them, not, as them not having a conscience. We label that as them being sadistic. We label that as them um, being self-centered because they're smiling 
when in fact, that's all we see is the smile. If we were really tuned in energetically through the vibration, we would know that the vibration behind the smile is one of stress and fear. See, that throws adults off all the time. When a child gets stressed out and they start smiling, the adult gets more angry because they see the behavior. That associated behavior of smiling has all these negative implications of, of not caring and a lack of concern for the adult. So the adult gets more stress. And then the child smiles more or they'll laugh until they don't. Well, see, it's just a representation of, in, of an internal state of stress, but you don't know that because you're stressed out too. You're in survival as well. So the stress model is so simple. It is so simple that all you have to do is, th is think about this. And I say, all you have to do, well, I've just all, this is all I've been doing for, for over 20 years. So all you have to do is think about when you're interacting with someone and they are stressed. I had one of my coaches just the other day had a phone call with a parent who was upset, who wasn't feeling heard, was feeling frustrated, feeling completely overwhelmed. And the parent called me and she was telling me, you know, all the ways in which my coach was not handling the situation, her communication appropriately. And I was just listening and I was just listening and I was just listening. And she said, I've got all the text messages. I've got text messages back from, from years, years and years, and I can share them. And I was just listening and I was just listening and I was just listening. And I said, oh, that, yeah, that's not, that sucks. That's terrible. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. I take responsibility for that. I'm just listening. I'm just listening. What can we do to make it better? How can I support you today? Today, how can I support you? She, oh, well, I got it all taken care of today. Okay, well, how can I support you tomorrow? I'm just listening. I'm just listening. And she says, just the fact that you're listening makes me feel better. Because her behavior, which is driven by her fear and her stress, her fear and her stress of transition, her fear and her stress of, 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 of not being supported, her fear and her stress of things not being predictable, things happening that, that are outside of everyone's control. Her fear and her stress drove, was driving her behavior. So it was my responsibility to number one, and so I talked to you guys about this in session one. Number one, the first thing I've got to do is I've got to reflect and I've got to be mindful on my own stress and my own fear. I've got all kinds of invitations in that moment to get stressed out and get scared. I mean, my coach is a representative of our company and I ultimately hold responsibility over our wraparound program. That's everything that is not working, everything that goes wrong ultimately is my responsibility. When there is a failure, it is my responsibility. It is my frustration. I might get frustrated, but I am more frustrated with myself. It is my responsibility. So there's all these invitations for me to get completely stressed out, become completely fearful, and then not listen, or not be supportive, not be encouraging, not try to help support, and then just make the, make the situation worse, or, or get mad at my coach and make it situation worse for her. So the parent goes on and she says, well, I'll text you, I'll text you, I'll send you the text message, the text exchange. She sends me the text exchange. And the very first text exchange is one in which, it, and this is just a beautiful thing. You know, a part is like video, when you can video something, when you can go back and reflect on a text message or an email, you know, we, we, sometimes we miss conversations. The coach, the mom's coach had called in because she has COVID. Mom had a lot of stuff planned for herself, for her kids, for herself. So she's really dependent on coach being there. And this is very important. We want to, as providers, we want to serve our families. We want to serve our families. That is our responsibility to serve our families. It is not our responsibility to get mired in the stress of our families. Because when we do that, we're not being helpful. So the coach explained that the, the other coach explained that the coach had the, the other coach had COVID and mom got stressed out. Said, oh my gosh, I was playing, I had I had all these things planned. And the coach said, I will be there. I will, I will be there to fill in. Don't worry. I can I I just have to go to an appointment on this day. 
Every other day I will be there. Mom got completely overwhelmed, res resorted back to her own blueprints of self-sufficiency and independence because that's what mom does. Mom takes care of everybody and everything and she doesn't let anyone take care of her. And so she reverted back to her blueprints completely did not hear what the coach said, who was trying to be supportive. But in that moment, mom was viewing the coach as a threat. And so then what happens is when mom doesn't receive the coach's momentary support and she comes back with more stress, the coach began, began to get stressed. And when the coach began to get stressed, the coach stopped hearing the mom. And when she stopped hearing the mom and then they're texting. So now you're having to, and everybody has had the experience of a text exchange that does not convey the authenticity of what's being expressed. Either you misperceive, you misperceive someone or you miss their cue. And before you know it, you're both like, what just happened? That's you know one of the un unfortunate side effects of texting. Sometimes you need to let this be instructional for my rap providers. It is okay to text, but the moment you experience the, the parent who you're serving as stressed and not really hearing and understanding you, stop texting. Just stop. Let a period of time go by. And if possible, just call. Just call. And what you may have to do is you may have to listen to them be really stressed out for a little bit of time. Breathe. And don't let the behavior cause you stress, to cause you fear, to cause you to feel overwhelmed. Right? So that's what, that's what happened. Both individuals became stressed and did not hear one another. And there was no, there was no bad communication. It's just that there was, there was not supportive communication because both people were stressed. Both people were stressed. And so it's just a great opportunity. And the reason I even asked for the text exchange, not because my coach is in trouble, but because I want to use it as an instructive opportunity. I didn't even know I was going to share it with you guys, but here we have it. So here's why I'm telling you about the stress model right now. Number one, because someone could hear this and have a breakthrough today. So it's that powerful. It's that powerful to think that all the behaviors that you have been experiencing with your child are rooted in stress. And if that's the case, then what do you need to do? You need to reduce the stress because if you reduce the stress, what happens? You reduce the behaviors. Look at that. Isn't, isn't that amazing? All behavior arises from a state of stress. In between the behavior and stress is the primary emotion, love and fear. It's through the expression. So talking about it, listening, understanding the fear when I can listen and I can be supportive and I can be understanding and I don't get overwhelmed, which means I keep my own stress down, which means I keep my own fear down. That means I stay open to an emotional state of love. That's where I can be supportive. When I can be in that place, when I can be in that place, then guess what? I'm reducing my child's fear I am reducing my child's stress and therefore I reduce my child's behavior. It works like clockwork every single time. So I wasn't even planning on going into the stress model in detail today, but I just did so someone can have a breakthrough today. And let me say something about this. This model alone, you've never, many of you never heard this model, okay? so. So you have wraparound services coming into your home and you view wraparound services as the support to your family that's gonna make everything better. It's not true. It's not the case. It's not gonna happen. We can't fix your family. We can't fix you as a parent. We can't fix your child. What we can do is support you. What we can do is help reduce your stress. What we can do is help reduce your anxiety and your fear. What we can do in that process is then help reduce your child's stress and fear and help you understand your child. We can educate you and help you understand your child's stress and their trauma and their behaviors differently and better. And then in the process of repetition, what we can do 
is help you become less reactive to their behaviors and to their stress and more responsive. Ultimately, what we can do is help you become less fearful and more loving. And in that process, you have the ability to have a breakthrough. Guess what? You could do that today just by hearing what I've just told you about the stress model. You can do that yourself today. You don't need Brian Post. You don't need wraparound services. You don't need anybody. Just by understanding this model, you have that power. You have that. This is not a lack of education. Your struggles with your child is not a lack of you knowing. It's not a lack of you being smart enough. It's not a lack of you. It's not a lack of you, um, you know, having not gone to graduate school, which, you know, that I could, you could throw that stuff out anyway, because I didn't learn anything in undergraduate or graduate or in doctoral studies that I didn't teach myself or learn from seminaries in the field. So what you have to realize is that you have everything within you to create love and regulation in your home. And it starts by calming your own stress calming your own stress, getting out of a state of fear and changing your behaviors. Because right now you're creating the same anxiety and stress and fear that your child is operating from, you're generating it as well. And that's creating a negative feedback loop. So I just said all that stuff. And I do believe someone's gonna take that and run with it. I also believe fear is so great. Fear is so great and your stress is so conditioned that you can't hear that right now today. So hopefully at the end of 10 weeks and with your coaches and with your, with, we're gonna be doing some intensive camps coming up and we're gonna be doing more support. And we, we've got more, we've got study groups going on, our fear to love study groups. And with your, with your in-home intensive coaching and your therapy support, you will be able to have that breakthrough that you need. But the only reason it takes so long and the only reason it takes so much energy and effort is because your fear is so conditioned. So it's so hard to get, to be present, to get to a place of seeing your child's trauma. Because when you can't see your child's trauma, it's hard to see anything. And fear is what causes you not be able to see your child's trauma. So let's talk about, since we we're talking about stress, let's talk about these two very important terms. Number one is regulation. So these are terms that regard that that regard to stress, that that are addressed in regards to stress. Regulation. Regulation is the ability to experience and maintain stress within one's window of tolerance. We, we all have a window of tolerance for how much stress we can handle. Now, this is so important. This is important for you as parents. It's important for you as providers. We all have a window of tolerance. Now, this is when we are operating within our window of tolerance, we are generally referred to as being calm, focused, or relaxed. We can be present when we're operating within our window of tolerance. Here's what I want you to understand. The longer you experience stress, and I'm going to go in, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into stress after this because it's important to understand that you can experience stress through any of your sensory pathways. Where is that at? Let's see. I had a slide for that. No, no, no. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to talk to that. I'm going to speak to that right here. The longer you're experiencing stress, the smaller your window of tolerance is becoming. The smaller your window of tolerance is becoming, the less, number one, the less oxytocin you have, oxytocin being your brain's anti-stress hormone, I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, the less oxytocin you're producing and the less ability you have to handle more stress. Very simple. The longer you're dealing with stress, and it could be boom, and your window tolerance goes boom, and then you go boom, you become stressed out. I was on a I was on a, a, a leadership call with my team the other day, and I heard something I did not like, and I said, "This stresses me out." It was like boom, it just immediately closes my window of tolerance, causes me to become overwhelmed and dysregulated. See, I have to honor that for myself. I honor that for myself. 
I understand my window of tolerance. When you're hearing stress, when your child is at school, they are using their window of tolerance. When they're playing with friends, when you're at work, when you wake up in the morning and you drive to work and you go, you work all day and you drive home, you're using your window of tolerance for how much stress you can manage. Guess what happens when your window of tolerance closes? When your window of tolerance closes, stress eclipses your window of tolerance. You're not producing enough oxytocin. You move into a state called dysregulation. Dysregulation is the experience of stress outside of your window of tolerance. It is your inability to handle any more stress. When you move into dysregulation, you are essentially stressed out. You are stressed out. It is believed that affect dysregulation is a fundamental mechanism involved in all psychiatric disorders. That is such a big scientific statement and, and it deserves so much time and I'm gonna come back to it later. So you have a window of tolerance and I always like to tell parents, you spend your entire day, and this is something very important for providers as well. You spend your entire day using your window of tolerance to drive to work, to listen to, to coworkers, to deal with your boss, to deal with customers, to, to worry about bills, to drive back home. And by the time you get back home, your window of tolerance is so small that this window of tolerance is now what you have to provide your family. So I like to say we spend the majority of our time, we spend the majority of our window of tolerance on the people who matter the least and the people who matter the most get the least of us. They get the least of us. The people that matter the most get the least of us. We have to learn how to recognize our window of tolerance getting smaller. We have to learn how to recognize our own states of dysregulation. And we have to condition ourselves to start breathing, start slowing down, start taking steps back and restoring that window of tolerance. So let's back up here for just a moment. So when we're talking about the stress model and I say all behavior arises from a state of stress. Now, keep in mind that all behavior arises from a state of stress. So if I, like right now, I'm stressed. Right now, I mean, I've, I've drank coffee. I've been up since 5.30. You know, I've gone, I've gone and participated in an, in an IEP meeting, a 504 meeting. I am, I am, I've got like home responsibilities. So I'm stressed but I'm utilizing my window of tolerance and I'm excited. So I'm excited because excitement and stress come from the same part of the brain. I'm excited because I'm going to talk to you guys for an hour. I'm going to rock and roll. I'm going to revolutionary. I'm, I'm revolutionized. I'm going to change someone's life. So I'm totally pumped up and excited, right? I'm using my window of tolerance, using my window of tolerance, using my window of tolerance, but I'm still operating within it. So I'm regulated. Now, here's what you have to understand. The behavior, your behavior, my behavior, your child's behavior is a byproduct of stress. Now, we can experience stress through any of the sensory pathways. I want you to write this down. You can experience stress through what you see. I'm gonna make this a slide too. So we'll, we'll probably get, we'll, we'll, I'll repeat this again in the next session. You can experience stress through what you see, what you smell, what you hear, what you touch, and what you taste. Now, let's say that again. You can experience stress, meaning you can utilize your window of tolerance, and this is almost always unconscious. You are not even aware that it is happening, and it is happening to you. You are experiencing stress, and you don't know it, you don't realize it. It's like smelling something foul and you're like oh gosh and then you you know you're driving on and then later you're like oh completely stressed out something about that smell may have triggered an old memory may have stirred you up encountering someone's negative energy might have triggered you in some way seeing someone that looks a certain way that reminds you of someone else could have triggered you in a certain way so what you see what you smell what you hear what you taste and what you touch 
five major sensory pathways all impact your window of tolerance. But guess what? There's more. But wait, there's more. Temperature, the temperature of your body. What's the temperature of your body right now? Right now, what's the temperature of your body? Ask yourself that. What's the temperature of your body right now? So if you're thinking about your body right now, what, how does it feel? Like I feel moisture right here in the crevice of my elbows. I feel a little moisture under my t-shirt because I'm active, I'm excited. Guess what? That's a sensory pathway. That's temperature. That's completely unconscious unless you become conscious of it. So if it got really hot, I could get really stressed because I'm using my window of tolerance and I don't even know it. Guess what? Movement. I'm moving as I'm lecturing. I'm moving. I'm shaking my chair moves. I'm moving. Movement is another sensory pathway. It's another sensory pathway. Guess what? Digestion. Digestion is another sensory pathway. These are, these are completely unconscious sensory pathways. You don't see these things happening. If you don't see them happening for you, how could you possibly, how could you possibly know they're happening to your child? You can't, you can't. So you have to remember, and there's one more, there's one more, there's nine, nine sensory pathways. Intuition, intuition is a sensory pathway. It is your guts response to the environment and it can cause you stress. Your intuition can tell you don't do that and you override it with your cognitive thinking because your cognitive brain is less evolved than your gut. Your gut doesn't have all this mindless chatter. That's why we say she had a gut feeling. A gut feeling, as Candace Pert says, is not a metaphor, it is a biological reality. So any of those, any of those experiences, that's nine sensory pathways, nine sensory pathways could cause you, hang on, let me see, make sure I did that right. Nine sensory pathways, did I click to share? I don't think I clicked to share on that. Nine sensory pathways could cause you to have a stress reaction. This is so important. It is so important because you won't know what is stressing your child? Sometimes you just won't know. Sometimes you'll know because they're irritable, because they're grumpy, because then you get stressed and you don't attend to that. But there are a lot of times that you don't know what's stressing your child out. You don't know what's stressing you out. And so it's so important that we keep that, that experience and that understanding of those sensory pathways in mind. Now, here's where it starts to get, get really, really like mind blowing in my opinion. It is believed that affect dysregulation is a fundamental mechanism involved in all psychiatric disorders. It is believed that being stressed out is a fundamental mechanism involved in all psychiatric disorders. Oh, look, it's, it's such a, it's such a beautiful, it's like my favorite, one of my favorite songs in the world is Claire de Lune by Claude Debussy. When I hear it, it just melts me. When I see this and think about this scientific fight, it's the same way. It's like, it's like angels are singing in my ears. It is believed that being stressed out is the fundamental cause involved in all psychiatric disorders. And I expand that and say, it is believed that being stressed out is the fundamental cause for all psychological, behavioral, cognitive, and physical ailments, diseases, and disorders. Being stressed out. Bruce Lipton's a cellular biologist, wrote a book called The Bio Biology of Belief. He said that 95% of disease is related to stress in the autonomic nervous system. 95%. Even the Atlanta study, the Atlanta Center for the Study of Disease Control said that in the, in the 90s, in the early 90s, said that 80%, and this is a conservative organization, 80% of disease and disorder is related to stress. When Taylor et al. said that it is believed that affect dysregulation being stressed out is the fundamental mechanism involved in all psychiatric, psychiatric disorders, they, they, I mean, it just like blew my mind, blew my mind. And it just reinforces the stress model that all behavior arises from a state of stress. So what do you have to do? What do you have to do? 
the first thing you have to do is you have to calm your stress. I saw, I, when I opened up the screen, I saw Robert there, one of my risk, but home parents. And Robert's wife called me one day and she said, we've got one of our kids, he's, you know, he's, he's outside, he's yelling, he's cussing, screaming, he's calling us the N word and, and he's, you know, he's throwing stuff and he's fussing. And, uh, you know, Robert's out there with him right now. And I knew what Robert was out there doing. Robert was out there trying to talk him down. And so, and so here's what I know. I know that being stressed out is the fundamental cause of all challenges. I know that. And I also know that typically when someone else is stressed out, if we're not really mindful, if we've not conditioned our brain, our body, mind system, if we've not conditioned and challenged our own inner self, that when someone else is stressed out, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to become stressed out. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to revert into a place of trying to control. We're going to revert into a place of trying to control. This is very important. Typically in our society to control means to overpower or to dominate or to change in some way. That's what control means in our society. If I'm going to control you means I'm going to take charge. The true definition of control is to influence, not to take charge, but to influence. So I said to Robert's wife, I said, Tell him, I said, where is, where is Robert? She said, he's outside. I said, tell him to come in the house. Now, now think about that. Now think about that. Just like philosophical. It's a 15 year old adolescent boy. He's completely stressed out. He's cussing. He's saying derogatory things, calling Robert the N word, which can be very culturally offensive. I, I, it, it doesn't phase me any longer because it's just another word, but it can be very culturally offensive if you're not, if especially as a 15 year old white kid calling this grown, and Robert's a big dude, this black kid, this black man, this, this derogatory remark and this kid just, you know, he just knows it as some word he can use to, to push more, you know, it's like his way of trying to protect and defend himself. He feels helpless in this moment. That's what I know. I know that in my brain. So I say to his wife, I said, tell him to come in the house. Now, why would I do that? Why would I do that? But see, what we have is we have two paradigms. We have two paradigms clashing. One paradigm says, you know, number one, it's my responsibility to take care of this kid and to calm this kid down. Number two, I'm completely overwhelmed because of the fact that this kid is being really disrespectful and rude and, and saying these really derogatory things. And number three, then I'm, I'm worried about his safety. Like, I don't want him to, you know, run away or I don't want him to get hit by a car or some of this stuff. So all of those, all of those beliefs in that moment are all mired in fear. It's obvious the kid is stressed out. It's completely obvious. So you got two really stressed out people in a dynamic. What's the best thing to do? One of them in that moment, not always, but one of them needs to get out of the situation. Obviously, the 15-year-old can't. I told Robert to go to move away, come come in the house. He did. The kid ended up walking to another to another parent's house that he knew, and then eventually came back home. You know, and so it's this it's this re, it's this recurring this recurring dynamic that we get locked into. But when we as adults get locked into it along with the kids, then we are not being beneficial. We are adding more stress to the environment with our presence. So I know when someone is stressed out, I know when someone is acting out, they're stressed out. And for us as parents and as adults, we have to learn to dial down our stress. Because if we don't dial down our stress, we can't help the children dial down their stress. And if we can't dial down their stress, we can't help them work through their traumas and we can't help them think clearly and we can't help them remember. Within the span of four days, I think it was more like three days, this kid went from saying all these derogatory things and, and cussing and all this kind of stuff to talking about when he comes back to stay with Robert and Sequoia. So it went from this place of feeling completely threatened to this place of feeling much more accepted, much more secure just over the course of a few days. We just have to stop 
reinforcing the negative feedback loop. It becomes very important. Okay, let's move on. So this is important. I love this. I, I don't. I don't quote. I don't use this. This. This quote as much. But it's really. It's really indicative of everything that we're dealing with. Infants. Infants in well-regulated parental systems. When an infant has come from a well-regulated parental system, remember last session I asked you to explore your blueprints and not just explore your blueprints of, of, of you growing up, but your parents, what your parents have went through, what your grandparents have went through, right? There, you will find trauma in the, in, the, in the generations. And that trauma does have the ability to impact you. Infants in well-regulated parental systems become effective self-regulators in the face of stress as young children separate from the caregiver. When an infant has learned how to regulate effectively, when they, get, when they grow up in an effective regulated environment, what happens is their brain changes. As their brain changes, their brain learns how to manage stress because their brain knows how to, learns how to produce oxytocin. As their brain learns how to produce oxytocin, their brain learns and creates the forms the pathways to help them to be able to calm down when they're stressed. When the brain is able to calm down, to learn that condition pattern of calming down when they're stressed, then what happens when the child becomes stressed separate from the parent? they can calm themselves down. It all goes back to infants in the well-regulated parental system. And as we talked about in session number one, this can go all the way back to conception in utero. As early as the fourth week after, after conception, the fetus can hear as early as the second trimester, the fetus is capable of thinking. There's nine months where the mother's experience is directly impacting the fetus. Many, you, many of you have children who have been, whose earliest life was mired in stress and addiction and overwhelm and neglect and abuse. And they are not effective self-regulators now because their earliest imprints did not set them up. Their earliest blueprints did not set them up to being able to regulate their stress. So guess what happens? Now, this is important because this affects us as, as parents as well. And it affects us as providers. When we become stressed and we do not have well-regulated parental systems as infants, we regress, we regress to the state of infancy. So there's some research done by Alan Shore, Affect Regulation and the Origin of the Self. He says, some adults in times of stress have the ability to regress to infancy. Adults, adults. Now, I'm gonna give you a little insight. This is for all of you. When we become stressed, eight times out of 10, 80% of the time, we are regressing to the stage of in utero to five years old, five years old. The behavior that's being generated is, is being manifested from an emotional age of conception of five. 10% of the time, it's adolescent. So 10% of the time is adolescent. 80% of the time, 80% of the time when we become stressed and we regress, we go all the way back to conception of five. And then about 10% of the time, we regress to adolescence. The other 10% of the time, we're able to navigate through the stress and be regulated and stay in our adult prefrontal cortex. But the far majority of the time, with, with yourself and with your child, in times of peak stress, we are regressing to conception to five. Now, what's the breakthrough in that? The breakthrough in that is if you can stop 
if you can stop looking at your child in the time of stress at their cognitive and their chronological age, primarily their chron chronological, even their physical, so the physical throws us off too. A child can be physically, physically big. And then when they become stressed, we, we misperceive the physical size as the threat. We have a 14 year old in our program who's six foot three, weighs 250 pounds. He's easy to misperceive as threatening. When in fact, when he becomes stressed, he's like a two year old. He's like a two year old. When you can, when you can accurately perceive not your child's chronological age, which is how old they are, not their physical age, which is the size of their body, not their cognitive age, which is how smart they are. But when you can accurately perceive your child's emotional age in the midst of stress, and you can respond to that age, you can have a breakthrough. You can have a breakthrough. Now, first, first, you have to not regress yourself. See, that's the biggest challenge. That's always going to become the, that's always going to be the biggest challenge. Throughout, throughout the next 10 weeks and throughout all the time that you are in our wraparound program and throughout the rest of your life with your child, because being a parent never changes, the single biggest challenge in the moment is always going to be whether you can stay regulated or whether you become dysregulated. And just becoming, just looking calm does not mean you're calm, right? Sometimes you're, I, I, I've had, I've literally had parents say before, well, it's pretty calm. I mean, it's, we're, we're, we're all walking on eggshells, but it's been pretty calm. And then I say, no, if you're walking on eggshells, you look calm, but you are stressed out. And it is just a matter of time before there is a big outburst because walking on eggshells is indicative of an internal experience of stress. When you can start to perceive, first of all, when you keep yourself from regressing and you're able to stay present, you slow down, you breathe, you stay present. And when you can perceive your child's emotional age, rather than their cognitive, chronological or physical, you can have a breakthrough because then by perceiving their emotional age, you become less threatened. And when you become less threatened, then you become more present, more emotionally present. And then you can respond to the emotional age. And when I say respond to the emotional age, it means instead of seeing the 14 year old who's six foot three, 250 pounds, I see a two year old who's stressed out and scared and feels helpless and overwhelmed. And I say to him, you're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. Hey, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna get through this. And he turns, he gets mad, he turns around and he starts walking off. And I wait, I don't follow him immediately because what do you do? You don't chase a two year old. I tell parents all the time, don't chase your children. The moment you're chasing your children, you're jacking up their amygdala, which makes them want to fight, fight, or freeze all over again. So with two-year-olds, they start running, and the moment you chase them, they run faster. They think it's a game, and then they stop paying attention, and then that's when accidents happen. Instead of chasing, watch, turn away from the child, walk in the opposite direction. They're gonna go about 10 feet. They're gonna turn around because this is attachment seeking behavior at this age. They're gonna turn around. They're gonna to look to see where you are. It's proximity seeking is what it's called. They're gonna to look to see where you are. When you're walking, walking away, you look back at them and you give them away and say, come on. And you keep walking. And then you're energetically pulling them towards you. When you're chasing them, you're actually causing them to run faster. When I can accurately perceive the 14 year old who's not 14, he's not six foot three and 250 pounds, but actually he's two and he's scared and he's helpless and he's overwhelmed. And he gets mad and I'm honoring him and I'm supporting him and he gets mad and he walks away and I don't follow him and I wait. 
and he goes and he stops and then maybe I walk over and instead of getting in his face, I stand beside him and maybe I start talking to him about something else that feels less threatening but more supportive. Before long, we're engaged in a, in a, in a conversation, in an exchange, which means he's actually moved up from two to five to seven to nine. He may or may not get all the way up to 14, but what I got to get, what I have to do is I have to get him out of two because until I get him out of two, we can't do anything. And then what happens when I'm getting him out of two, I am not only, this, this, this is an amazing thing. Let me, I, 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 I got to show you this. I got to show you this. I got to show you this. And then, and then we're going to end. Okay. Let me show you. We're gonna pick. We're gonna pick back up on this in our next session. And I actually had several more slides I was gonna I was gonna go through. But when he stressed, see, this is where trauma stored. Trauma is stored in the brainstem. Trauma is stored in the brainstem. So it's stored down here. When the child, when the fourteen year old becomes stressed. He goes down and he starts tapping on the brainstem and he starts stirring up old memories, which have old emotional experiences connected to them. And so when this happens, the greater the stress, the deeper into the brainstem it goes. And then so it's overwhelming this part of your brain, the hippocampus. It's overwhelming your hypothalamus. Your amygdala is just getting spiked up more and more and more. Your amygdala is your fight, flight, or freeze. And then what it happens is it sends these signals, these confused and distorted signals to the prefrontal cortex. So everything out here looks like danger because these signals are coming, it's a stressed out brain. Joseph Ledo said in times of stress, our thinking becomes confused and distorted and our short term memory is suppressed. So when the 14 year old is stressed, all these signals are, are, are literally protruding through his thinking. And they're all, they're all coming from this place of stress. So what happens is when I, in that moment, realize that he's stressed and that he's two years old and not 14 years old, the first thing that starts happening is I start sending to him a soothing signal. The first thing that starts happening, when I'm not threatened by him, because I'm no longer seeing him as a, as a six foot three, 250 pound, potentially dangerous 14 year old young man whose mom has labeled him as aggressive and potentially even violent. When I'm not seeing him that way, I automatically start sending him soothing signals to his amygdala, which is actually starts to turn on his oxytocin. Now, this is important. This is, this, is, this is the essence of healing trauma. When the state level of memory is open, that's when we have the greatest ability. Oh, when the state level of memory is open, remember when he's stressed, when the child is stressed, the state level of memory opens up. That's when their trauma is being released. Their tra and trauma is just an energy. Trauma is an energy. It is, it, is a, it is a stored experience in the brain that has an energy attached to it. And so it's trauma energy. When we start talking about trauma, we're just talking about energy because it's a past experience. It's not happening right now. So it's a trauma energy that's getting stored. And that energy is what's being generated in his brain. Well, that's that's the, the level that we have to work to create healing for these children. I'll say that again. That is the level that we have to work to create healing for these children. So when he's completely overwhelmed, that is actually the ideal time for a breakthrough. When a child is completely stressed out and losing their ever living freaking mind, that is the perfect opportunity for a breakthrough. Because what happens when you can have a child in that deep state of dysregulation, which is in that brainstem state, and you don't create more stress, what you're doing 
is you're going in and you're generating an oxytocin response in the midst of that trauma energy. And what happens, Bruce Perry says, the brain always, and this is the power of repetition. Bruce Perry says, the brain always returns to the way the event was handled the last time. The brain always returns to the way the event, the encounter of the last event. So if I have a child who's completely losing his mind and I handle it in a positive way, the next time he becomes super stressed out, his brain is going to go back to the way the experience was handled the last time, which is going to dial off just a little bit, just a little bit of that negative intensity of that trauma energy. It's like, it's gonna shave it down. It's gonna shave down just a little bit of that trauma energy. But you have to understand this trauma energy is conditioned. So it may, if that, if that stress keeps spiking, boom, that child's gonna burst right through and he's gonna be right back in that same state. But if again, if again, I am able to connect and stay present and connect with that child in the midst of that trauma energy and what I tell parents all the time, when your child is acting out, that is the greatest single opportunity for a breakthrough. When they're acting out, it's when you get to create healing. But the problem is in our society, when our children are acting out, it's when we want to stress them out even more. And that's why children grow older, but they don't grow better. If I can stay present, if I can do something different, I just want to encourage you to do something different. If I can encourage you to do something different today and tomorrow until next week, just do it once. Just do it twice. Here's your homework. Homework for session two. Think about your child's problem behaviors. Think about your child's problem behaviors. Think about how you usually react to their problem behavior. Write down one or two or three of those things and then choose, tell yourself you're going to do something different. And that different may be that you get up and you walk away. That different may be that you don't yell, that you talk softly. That difference may be that you say, I understand. That difference may be that you say, I, I see that you're stressed. That difference may be that you put your hands on your heart and you say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, take the wheel. Steer me, Jesus, lead me through these troubled waters. It may be that. But what I want you to do is I want you to do twice. Twice, two times over the next week. That's How simple is that? Two times over the next week, I want you to do something different than you normally do when it comes to your child's problem behavior. Problem behavior is not going to go away. It's not going to go away. It'll be back. But here's what's going to happen. If you do something different, the next time that behavior comes up again, you will notice that the energy behind the behavior is a little bit less. You just shaved a little bit of the energy off of it. And if you can do that consistently, you are well on your way to having a breakthrough. All right, guys, that's session two. Have a fantastic week. Be amazing. Be awesome. You are a vessel of love and healing. We just have to remove fear from your life. We have to be courageous. Courage is not the absence of fear. It is the ability to move forward in the midst of fear. That's what courage is. You have the power to be able to do these things and to do this work. God bless you. I'll see you next week.